Finally, how can you provide meaningful input? So when you're reviewing the proposals today, real important, you're not, cr you're not critiquing it for terminology. You're looking for ways to improve it with a patient perspective. Offer suggestions. Okay? Remember that the researcher has their goals, but the patient should always have their goals. Balance those out. I would generally assume the quality is okay. okay? By the time you get a proposal, don't get lost in the details and the statistics and all those kinds of things. Assume that it's a pretty good quality. The biggest problem, the biggest thing, as I said, was make sure that the design of the study answers the question properly. You know, an observational study versus an experimental study. Again, you probably don't have to worry about that, but just kind of match those up. And then the big thing that we, that we see in getting patients involved is just make sure that the language and the consent is understandable. So the big thing that you're going to find out is you'll see the proposal that will have intro methods and all that. Remember I told you there'll be the IRB approval, there's going to be informed consent. Focus on the informed consent because that's where you can provide a lot of input to the researcher to say you should include this or that in your informed consent. Look for these specific components. We already talked about PICO. Also the specific aim, the purpose. Is it really truly something that's really relevant to you? Is it important for patients? If it's not important for patients, who cares? Researchers can want to do their own thing. They may be interested in how much hair a rat loses if they run on a treadmill. Does that matter to you? No, but it, it's important to the researchers. So have you seen the research that gets funded in universities because people like to examine crickets and grasshoppers and their ability to jump at night? You're seeing studies on this stuff all the time because that's what researchers are interested in, but you guys have to be interested in it as well. Look for the bias, obviously. Uh, make sure the procedures are practical. The outcomes are, again, patient-centered. And then, of course, recruitment and retention is really important. That's your main factor we want you to be really cognizant of is what are the factors of the study that would help us to get patients in, get them there faster, and keep them. Uh, and then, as I said, look for the consent and other types of unseen problems that the researchers may not have. PubMed, clinicaltrials.gov, great places. So, question. Did, hopefully, um, did we meet our goals? Are you familiar with, techno with some of the terminology now? Okay. Are you able to review? We'll find out after we do our little mock review, right? And then can you feel, uh, do you feel confident to offer suggestions? These are the things that we need to take what I just talked about and apply it immediately after the break when we get into reviewing a proposal. So we'll be around to help kind of answer some questions and Ellen will, I guess, lead that, right? Um, and these are the things we want you to be able to do. So. Um, I just threw this up. Ellen had sent this to me. This is the new scope for AAMDS. Uh, I really appreciate all of the, the support. That the, the reason why I do this, I do this you know, on my own time uh, because of being a patient. When I was diagnosed, AAMDS website gave me a lot of great information. And, and the links to the videos that you guys did with Dr. Young and Dr. Townsley really got me interested in the, the clinical trials. And I was very fortunate to be treated by the top uh, uh, bone marrow failure docs at NIH, and it's kind of my way of, of, of giving back. I hope that it was helpful for you. Um, my job as a clinic, clinical researcher and educator is to kind of pay it forward, so I want you guys to go out and hopefully you'll be able to help not just, you know, your group uh, and yourselves, but help other patients down the road, which is kind of why I got involved in this as well. So with that, here's, if you ever have any questions, um, there's my email, my uh, Twitter, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I've really gotten, <laughs> Facebook has gotten so time consuming for me, so uh, actually all social media is kind of difficult, but it is now, interestingly enough, Twitter is the main way that I keep up with research, believe it or not. What happened, Facebook is just social, it's really just about your friends and your family and letting them know what you're doing, but if you really want to keep up with research, I find that Twitter is the best way to do it. You follow AAMDS, you follow the NIH, you follow these people. Because what Twitter's become is basically a news aggregator. It's not, I woke up today and had cereal. You know, that's what Facebook is for. What Twitter is for is to keep up with the news. And it happens very fast. And it happens in a timely manner. So I highly recommend, I highly recommend uh, following Twitter. And again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. And with that. But I was going to ask you guys, as patients and caregivers, what are outcomes that you want research to focus on? Besides curing your disease or managing your symptoms, 
What are things that are important to you? While they, these are like goals for you as a patient or a caregiver, these are not outcomes that a scientist would likely be looking at. They wouldn't be look care, they're, they're, not, they're not worried about caregiver burden or measuring it when their, their research is about proving drug X is better than drug Y. Or, you know, they, they don't think that clinic appointments are, can, are burdensome because, yeah. you know, you got to come have your counts checked, you got to have that bone marrow biopsy, you got to have to have this done or x-ray or whatever, and, you know, because they're not, they're not living it like you guys are. And, and exactly like what Phil said, that's one of the reasons you guys have all been brought here, is to, to tell these researchers what are, is important to you. Um, so a few other outcomes that I thought about as I put this together is, you know, what about the burden of avoiding crowds? How many patients who have bone marrow failure become isolated? You're, you're not just isolated in the, while you're in the hospital. You're still isolated when you leave the hospital. And that has a huge impact on your mo emotional and mental well-being. It has and physical. Physical, and it has an impact on your family relationships. Mm -hmm. it, it has an impact on so many different things. Um, you know, disparities in care. You know, depending on where the research is being done, is all the different groups that could have this disease process, are they being represented? Um, you know, um, for instance, Minorities are not well represented in the National Marrow Donor Program for Be The Match. It's very difficult to get uh, patients who are of Hispanic, African American, and Asian descent to find matches because the majority of people who are donors are Caucasian. And also disparities for families with fewer financial resources. It's expensive to be sick. Not everybody, even though the NIH is free, might not be able to get there. Not be, might not be able to stay outpatient once you're there. I don't, I, I'm not quite sure. I don't know how the NIH works, if they have housing for you. But, um, you know, these are all big obstacles for patients. And that you guys, you know, these are what would be likely in the secondary or exploratory objectives in a protocol.